Welcome everyone, uh, and a particularly, particularly a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker today, Judge Song Hong Song. I'm David Lee, professor in the Dyson School, a provost fellow in the office of the Vice Provost for International Affairs, uh, Fred Logoval. A couple words about the Anaudi Center in this speaker series. Uh, since its founding, the Anaudi Center has helped stimulate and coordinate Cornell's work in and around the world including playing an important role in Cornell's mission to produce students who will become the citizens and leaders of tomorrow. The center provides a forum for a broad dialogue that cuts across the disciplines and serves to internationalize the university's research, teaching, and outreach. The Foreign Policy Distinguished Speaker Series, which is today hosting Judge Song, is part of the Anaudi Center's major focus on foreign policy. Since it was launched in 2006, this initiative has formed a foreign policy network of more than 35 faculty from across the campus, started a current events class for undergraduates, provided startup funding for ongoing and new activities in foreign policy studies, brought expertise to campus to address important topics like that today, and welcomed postdoctoral fellows in global affairs this fall. We're very grateful for the support received for our foreign policy programming from the uh, Sao Giacomo Charitable Foundation, Judy Biggs, and the Bartels family. Today's talk is also co-sponsored by the Cornell Law School. Since 2006, the, distinct, the Foreign Policy Distinguished Speaker Series and the Anaudi Center have welcomed over 40 speakers, uh, most of which are listed on the back of today's program. Uh, just a couple brief notes about two upcoming events next month. On November 18th, Francis Fukuyama from Stanford University, John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago, and Isabel Hull and Peter Katzenstein, both from Cornell, will participate in the Anaudi Center's International Forum uh, entitled Will Democracy Have Competitors in the 21st Century uh, at 5 p.m. in Schwartz Auditorium in Rockefeller Hall. On November 21st, the president of Iceland, Olafur Ragnar Grimson, will speak at Schwartz Auditorium as well. His lecture is uh, entitled Iceland's Clean Energy Economy, a Roadmap to Sustainability and Good Business. And that will conclude the Foreign Policy Distinguished Speaker Series for 2014. Today, uh, it is my honor to introduce Judge Sang Hyung Song, the president of the International Criminal Court, who will discuss the preventive potential of the International Criminal Court. Judge Song was first elected judge of the International Criminal Court in March 2003 and then re-elected to uh, a further full term of nine years. He was elected president of the court in 2009 and then re-elected in March 2012 to another three-year period term. He's assigned to the appeals division of the court. Judge Song has extensive practical and academic experience in the areas of court management, civil and criminal procedure, and the law of evidence. For more than 30 years, he taught as a professor of law at Seoul National University Law School. He's also held visiting professorships at a number of law schools, including Harvard, NYU, Melbourne, and Wellington. Judge Sung first attended Seoul National University Law School, where he earned his Bachelor of Laws degree. He then attended Tulane University Law School as a Fulbright Fellow obtained a diploma in comparative legal studies from the University of Cambridge and a JSD degree from our own Cornell Law School. Judge Song started his legal career as a judge advocate in the Korean Army and later as a foreign attorney in a New York law firm. He has served as a member of the advisory committee to the Korean Supreme Court and the Ministry of Justice. He has led initiatives to reform the national litigation system and the criminal justice system, particularly the reform of the penal code, the code of criminal procedure, the court rules of criminal procedure and the prison system. Judge Song has vast experience in relevant areas of international law, principally international humanitarian law and human rights law. He's co-founder of the Legal Aid Center for Women and the Childhood Leukemia Foundation in Seoul and is the president of UNICEF Korea. Judge Song is also the respected author of several publications on legal issues ranging from law and economics to legal education social justice, and a review of the conventions on uh, human rights and children's rights. He is also the recipient of the highest decoration of the Korean government, the Grand Order of Mongongwa, in 2011. Please join me in welcoming, uh, welcoming Judge Song.
Professor Lee, thank you very much for your kind introduction. I'm grateful to the Mario uh, Einaudi Center for International Studies for the invitation to speak here today. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it is my great pleasure to be back here at Cornell. I do have to say that a few faces around here have changed since I first walked uh, into the campus. But it might have something to do with the fact that that was 45 years ago. <laughs> Nevertheless, the spirit of Cornell remains the same. Today, I had a chance to meet with some students over lunch, and I was reassured to see that the pursuit of knowledge and excellence combined with the quest for common good is still going strong. And why would it not be? It is easy to be inspired here at the most beautiful campus in the whole world. Our minds work better if we need our souls and bodies, uh, if we feed our souls and bodies too. Cornell has fantastic recreational facilities, which are a real asset. When I studied here, I enjoyed many different sports from tennis to golf and ping pong and volleyball. Anyway, I'm aware that I was not invited here just to reminisce about old times. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to speak to you about the International Criminal Court, or the ICC in which I have been a judge since 2003 and the president since 2009. More specifically, I would like to discuss the preventive potential of the ICC. I will argue that the ICC and the broader system of international criminal justice are key tools in the prevention and deterrence of the most atrocious acts imaginable, such as genocide, ethnic cleansing, systematic rape as a weapon of war, the use of child soldiers, and so on. However, I will have to go back to the past one more time to put this topic in context. 64 years ago, an armed conflict broke out in my home country, Korea. I was nine years old boy at that time, too young to be mobilized, but old enough to realize the horrors of the war. For three months during the battle for Seoul City, my family had to hide in a hot and humid underground bunker. It was solely my responsibility to emerge above the ground every day to find food and bring it back to my bunker. To do this, I had to walk about 10 miles every day. Many times when warplanes appeared in the sky, started uh, dropping bombs in the city, I had to run for cover, dropping all the groceries I had just collected. During daily trips to find food, 
I passed hundreds of dead bodies lying on the street. To this day, I can precisely remember the horrible stench of the decomposing corpse in those hot summer days. For a nine-year-old boy, these were highly traumatic experiences, and they left a permanent mark on me. I barely survived the war, but um, without much physical injury, and went on to study law. I devoted my life to the search for justice and the improvement of society through the rule of law. Ultimately, my work led me to the International Criminal Court, which brought me once again face to face with the terrible consequences of armed conflict and unrestrained brutality. As president of the ICC, I visited many communities affected by atrocities in Uganda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I did meet with many former child soldiers and the other victims who were now struggling to rebuild their lives. Some were missing limbs or had had their eyes or nose or lips intentionally cut off. These encounters stirred the experiences of my childhood. And I had to ask myself, how can hundred, uh, humans do such a thing to one another? Surely, there must be a way to stop such brutality, such madness. There is a way. I strongly believe that the world can change, that human societies can improve. Look at the progress we have made in the last century in the fields of education, gender equality, democracy, technology, and healthcare. Time and again, we see that humankind is capable of great advances. But changing the world for the better is really hard work. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., I quote, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. The end of the quote. These are words of wisdom. Progress does not occur overnight. Obstacles have to be removed bit by bit with persistent effort. It is a long process and may only occasionally culminate in historic breakthroughs when the conditions are right to bear the fruit of arduous labor. The adoption of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court in 1998 was exactly one such breakthrough. The ICC is a response to the abuse of power and armed force that has plagued our planet since times immemorial. 
throughout history, countless children, women, and men have suffered unspeakable atrocities. Entire populations have been exterminated, expelled, or enslaved. Time after time, armed forces have committed <clears throat> despicable acts of sexual violence, torture, pillage, and cruelty under the guise of war have rampaged in every corner of our shared earth. The laws of warfare have developed over thousands of years from the writings of Sun Tzu in China and the laws of Manu in India. These uh, call for the humane treatment of civilians, prisoners, and the sick and wounded. Customary laws of war started to take the form of international humanitarian law after the advent of the International Committee of the Red Cross in 1863 and the promulgation of the Liber Code by President Abraham Lincoln in the same year. The Liber Code, which instructed to the Union forces on conduct in wartime, subsequently provided much of the basis for the Hague Conventions adopted around the turn of the 20th century. But the horrific events of the Second World War showed that conventions alone were not nearly sufficient. While they created legal undertakings between sovereign states, there was no enforcement mechanism. Furthermore, while treaties provided rules for international warfare, they contained hardly any provisions applicable to internal conflicts or to protect populations from abuse by their own government. To address these deficiencies, the international community adopted fresh legal instruments including the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the four Geneva Conventions, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Holding some of the main architects of the worst atrocities accountable, the Nuremberg and Tokyo Tribunals, laid the foundations for modern international criminal justice. However, these efforts were reactions to criminal acts already committed. The world still lacked a credible mechanism to put leaders on notice that they will be held accountable if they commit atrocities in the future. The idea of a permanent international criminal court was born. Work on its creation commenced under the auspices of the United Nations, but the project soon fell into oblivion as the Cold War overshadowed all else. Atrocities continued occurring around the globe with few attempts to hold the perpetrators accountable. But the prospect of international criminal justice was simply too powerful to wither. The proposal to create an international criminal court reemerged at the end of the Cold War and quickly became a powerful movement which gathered civil society, 
legal communities, and diplomats behind the compelling goal. Efforts to set up a permanent ICC gained even more wind with the establishment of the ad hoc war crimes tribunals for, for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. With astonishing speed, negotiations led to a result that few had thought possible. On the 17th of July, 1998, a multilateral conference convened by the UN adopted the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court with 120 votes in favor and only seven against, unfortunately including the vote of this country. This was an enormous victory, but in the wake of the celebrations, there was marked cautiousness, as most supporters assumed that it would take ages to reach the threshold of 60 ratifications for the Rome Statute to enter into force. However, to the surprise of everyone, this happened in less than four years. The ICC was formally created on the 1st of July, 2002. And by the end of 2003, more than half of the world's sovereign states had joined the treaty. This did not signal the end of challenges for the ICC. When the first judges convened in The, uh, in the Hague in 2003, including myself, many of us were seriously wondering whether this new baby court would survive the hostility it was still facing from many quarters, particularly from the United States. But the ICC did survive, and today, we can safely say that the ICC is here to stay. The Rome Statute now has 122 states parties, and uh, even though major powers such as the US, Russia, and China have not yet joined the treaty, they all acknowledge the ICC's important role in international peace and justice. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, the ICC did not pop up out of nowhere. It is the result of a long history, as well as part of a broader development on the international plane. During the last two decades, we have witnessed quite a proliferation of international criminal courts, from the Yugoslavia and Rwanda tribunals to the special panels in East Timor, the extraordinary chambers in Cambodia, the special court for Sierra Leone, and the special tribunal for Lebanon. But as I already noted, the ICC is different from these temporary institutions in one crucial aspect. It is not just dealing with the crimes of the past. It is also part of a permanent international rule of law structure that we are putting in place. This gives the ICC a significant potential for the prevention of future crimes, which is the main topic of my talk today. The potential for preventive effect 
appears in several different forms. And I would like to categorize them under the broad headings of one, deterrence, two, timely intervention, three, stabilization, and four, norm setting. First, let us look at deterrence. One of the main purposes of punishment in traditional criminal history. This is the most direct preventive effect of international justice. But I do not believe it is necessarily the most significant one. Deterrence is notoriously difficult to measure since we essentially need to look at the relationship between justice administered and the absence of, of crimes. In a national setting with the ordinary crimes, it is possible to produce uh, statistics, perhaps, with the meaningful data. If the number of uh, break-ins, for example, has dropped from, say, 800 down to 500 per year in a given area, it may be possible to connect this change to concrete factors such as improved police response, as, uh, et cetera. A similar exercise is far more difficult with regard to atrocity crimes. Every situation is unique, and each conflict has its own specific historical and political setting. The greatest challenge is causality. There are so many factors affecting the occurrence of atrocities that it is close to impossible to determine what the effect of deterrence is. Nevertheless, I do firmly believe that a deterrent effect is slowly emerging, even though the evidence may thus far be largely anecdotal. Arrest warrants for sitting head of state issued by the ICC, as well as other in international courts, demonstrate that no one is immune from accountability and the likelihood of punishment has grown. Two years ago, a senior minister of the Democratic Republic of the Congo came all the way to The Hague and told me that tensions surrounding the recent elections in his country had been very high and the fear of large-scale violence, violence erupting uh, very real. Fortunately, large-scale bloodshed was avoided, and the minister attributed this largely to the ICC's deterrent effect. People had seen both DRC nationals as well as uh, <clears throat> Kenyan politicians uh, facing the ICC in The Hague, the latter being charged specifically with the allegations of post-election violence. In the minister's assessment, everyone knew that those committing atrocities would end up before the ICC. Another example, When the trial chamber of the ICC convicted Mr. Lubanga, uh, a warlord in the DRC, a very notorious one, um, on the ground of child soldiery, many rebel armies around the world, more specifically, the communist guerrillas who 
or specifically used child soldiering tactics in Nepal, released 3,500 child soldiers within a couple of days. Anyway, <clears throat> next I will look at timely intervention as an important part of the preventive functions. Here I refer to the ability of the ICC to react to the threats of crimes at an early stage. The ICC's advantage in this type of situations is that the prosecutor does not need to consult anyone to open a preliminary examination for events that are potentially within the jurisdiction of the ICC. Where the threat of imminent atrocities appears, announcing publicly that the ICC is following the situation can be a powerful tool. It puts any potential perpetrators on notice that they might be held liable for their actions. It can also draw local as well as international attention to the situation and induce the national stakeholders to take necessary action to defuse the tensions. If atrocity crimes do occur and the national authorities are unable to address the situation, then the ICC can open an investigation, but this does not necessarily have to lead to trials before the ICC. In the best case scenario, the ICC's investigation will prompt the national authorities to investigate and prosecute the alleged crimes in an expeditious manner, thereby reducing the likelihood of further crimes. Let me now move on to stabilization. By this I mean the capacity of international justice to contribute to long-term peace stability and equitable development in post-conflict societies. These are fundamental guarantees for a future free of violence. Indeed, the former interim president of Guinea told me that membership in the ICC was a vital aspect in stabilizing the potential situation in his own country after a coup d'etat. The connection of peace and justice is well recognized. They are not mutually exclusive. On the contrary, they reinforce each other. Where impunity is allowed to reign, it leaves a desire for vengeance among populations who have been victims of massive crimes and provide a fertile ground for the recurrence of conflicts. Indeed, the World Bank's groundbreaking World Development Report of 2011 recognizes transitional justice as one of the core tools to forestall cycles of violence. A research suggests that countries that have held former leaders accountable for their crimes have, in most cases, come away stronger. Accountability for past atrocities and the strengthening of the rule of law are key ingredients in the healing of post-conflict societies. But attributing guilt to individual perpetrators is not sufficient. To enable a more comprehensive process of justice, 
The founders of the ICC decided to introduce two very innovative approaches for the empowerment of victims. First of all, the ICC is the first international judicial body to allow participation of victims in the criminal proceeding in their own right and not just as witnesses. People who are victimized by powerful criminals have now become actors in international proceedings designed to prosecute those crimes. Along with this, the Rome Statute pays a special attention to the needs of women and children who are often the most vulnerable victims of atrocities. The ICC's legal documents extensively codify uh, specific crimes against the women and impose a responsibility on each organ of the ICC to ensure the safety, psychological health, dignity, and confidentiality of female victims and witnesses. The ICC represents a step away from the traditional male-dominated world, also by being the first international court with a majority of female judges on the bench. In fact, nine with nine out of the current 16 ICC judges being women, a male judge like me might soon be endangered species. <laughs> the second innovative feature of the ICC is the possibility to provide reparations and assistance to victims. One aspect of this is judicial reparation orders, and we may see the first final decisions on this in the near future. Another aspect is the creation of trust fund for victims, which is without precedent in international criminal justice. The fund is nourished by voluntary contributions from governments as well as from private sources, recognizing both the rights and needs of victims and their families. The fund empowers victims to become key stakeholders in the pursuit of transitional justice. More than five years of victim assistance in northern Uganda and the Democratic Republic of the Congo have seen the Trust Fund for Victims mature into a solid institution. By recognizing the particular needs of victims of the most serious crimes, for instance, for um, reconstructive surgery, trauma-based counseling, uh, vocational training, uh, provision of artificial limbs, um, introduction of uh, community-based uh, educational programs for children. And <clears throat> the Trust Fund has been uh, able to articulate a truly human dimension to the process of international criminal justice. Finally, I come to norm setting. This I see as the ICC's uh, greatest potential to have a significant preventive effect by entrenching a system of norms that outlaw atrocities. I do not mean only a layer of international laws that make certain crimes punishable. 
what we need to achieve uh, is a strong system of legal and moral norms that make the Rome Statute uh, crimes not only punishable, but also simply unacceptable everywhere in the world. I am fully aware that this is an ambitious vision and one that will take a long, long time to achieve. The fact that a state ratifies an international treaty does not mean that all the rights defined in there miraculously take immediate effect. But with the proper national implementation, with uh, political will, with education, with democratic support, and with peer pressure and support from the international community, adherence to treaties can make a huge difference. In the best scenario, the emergence of legal norms and the strengthening of a core societal values is a mutually reinforcing process. But this is the distance between an international treaty and the social norms of local community too large? How can this gap be bridged then? Here, the complementarity principle of the Rome Statute is of crucial importance. Under this particular principle, the national judiciary of each state retains the right and indeed the primary duty to investigate and prosecute grave violations of international humanitarian law and international law. Therefore, each ICC state party is expected to make all ICC crimes punishable under its national laws and ensure that the country's law enforcement system is fully capable of investigating and prosecuting such offenses. If this is properly done, the international legal norms of Rome statute also uh, becomes uh, domestic norms within each uh, state party. This particularly when combined with the proper awareness raising, can in turn bolster efforts of the civil society to promote adherence to critical human rights norms. Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude my remarks, I would like to mention some of the many challenges faced by the evolving system of international criminal justice. The first one of them is the capacity building of national jurisdictions. The domestic justice systems of states should be so well equipped to deal with Rome statute crimes that they can serve as a primary deterrent worldwide. While the ICC is, is a safety net that ensures accountability when the national jurisdictions are unable for whatever reason to carry out this task. Where states require assistance in building uh, this capacity, the ICC can only provide a limited help, for example, in suggesting possible sources of support. Substantive assistance needs to come from elsewhere, for example, from other states parties which have the necessary resources or from international or regional organizations. Another crucial challenge is the cooperation of states with the ICC. As you know, ICC has 
no police force of its own. The ICC relies entirely on states to execute our arrest warrants, to provide evidence, to facilitate the appearance of witness, and so on and so forth. Without the cooperation of states, the ICC is powerless. Unfortunately, several suspects subject to ICC arrest warrant have successfully evaded arrest for many years. Political will to bring these persons to justice is crucial. But don't misunderstand that um, ICC has is having a difficulty of getting a state uh, cooperation. Nine out of 10 cases, the state cooperation is forthcoming. And uh, we, the ICC, even enjoys uh, very close cooperation with uh, even with the United States, which stays uh, still outside the Rome statute system. Another key challenge that we face in our aspirations to make the uh, Rome Statute truly comprehensive is to achieve universality. It is remarkable that 122 states have voluntarily acceded to the Rome Statute, thereby accepting all the obligations as well as benefits that this brings. But with more than 70 countries that have yet to join, a majority of the human race remain outside the Rome Statute's legal protection. This is of great concern to me. My own region in particular, the Asia Pacific, is most underrepresented in the ICC, with only 18 um, member states among the 122 states parties. And of course, the United States has, uh, too, has not yet joined the ICC, but I hope that will happen eventually. Ladies and gentlemen, I have focused on the Rome Statute and the ICC. But of course, international criminal justice will always be only one, one piece in much bigger puzzle of protecting human rights, suppressing conflict, and working for peace and stabilization. Where atrocities have already occurred, a multiple, multitude of other transitional justice mechanisms are necessary in addition to criminal justice, such as public acknowledgement of crimes, finding missing persons, and sustainable return of refugees, so on. In the case of ongoing or imminent conflict and atrocities, justice can rarely act alone. And diplomacy is usually the main international tool of a rapid reaction to prevent escalation of violence. Likewise, political solutions are necessary to bring conflicts fully to an end. Where long-term prevention is concerned, education, democracy, and development are at least as important as a credible system of criminal justice. There are not merely, these are not merely theoretical considerations. A realistic understanding of the possibilities and limitations of international justice is a prerequisite to its success. Ladies and gentlemen, I have demonstrated to you that the long-term value of the International Criminal Court lies 
not only in the punishment of perpetrators, but also perhaps even more in the prevention of future crimes. That has been a great source of motivation for me during the last, during the last 11 years that I have served at the ICC. The late Justice William Brennan of the US Supreme Court wrote in a law review um, article in uh, 1958 that, I quote, the law is not an end in itself, nor does it provide ends. It is preeminently a means to serve what we think is right. The end of the quote. This applies to the Rome Statute as well. It is a means to serve what we think is right. Humans are capable of extreme cruelty as well as powerful compassion. And the ultimate value of the ICC is in entrenching moral and legal norms that will help the latter prevail over the former. Thank you very much.